Um, when Christina asked if I would be willing to speak, uh, and I uh, uh, offered to do so, she also asked who might be another uh, good speaker uh, to present. And uh, Dr. Christian Lude, who is uh, our other speaker today, is a PhD basic scientist, uh, but he is one of the basic scientists who's most attuned to clinical problems yeah, and, and, and clinical medicine. And he's willing to talk about such a challenging problem of calcinosis, uh, which is one that uh, the everybody is really struggling with. We, we need to understand things better. We need to understand uh, how to treat it. Um, and I'm excited that he has been willing to take the plunge. Um, Dr. Lude is an associate professor in the rheumatology division in the Department of Medicine at the University of Washington, where I also work and where I also um, uh, co-head the scleroderma clinic. Um, and uh, Dr. Lude also, though, uh, in addition to that role, is involved with uh, development of novel tests, understanding, uh, understanding the basic mechanisms of, of autoimmune diseases. Um, and uh, I know when, again, when Christina asked me, uh, I, I know he's an experienced and, uh, presenter and can make the most complicated things clear. So I am personally looking forward very much to hearing what Christian uh, has to uh, teach us today about calcinosis. Dr. Lou, you're on. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Mark. And let me just start sharing the screen and we'll get going. <clears throat> Does that look well for everyone? Yes, it looks clear. Yes, it Excellent. does. Excellent. And just a brief background. And thank you everyone again for attending this morning and for allowing me to share some of our some of our thoughts. And I would love for this to be an open discussion. Please feel free to interrupt anytime. Um, what <laughs> Mark may have forgotten to, to mention is that I'm not from, from the US originally, but just briefly as a background, I grew up in... Um, in Sweden on a small farm. So that's kind of where I, my background. And then I studied at London University to study primarily lupus pathogenesis. Did a brief training on uh, cardiovascular disease. And then I went here to the US in 2013. And since 2016, I've been here at University of Washington leading my a research team, trying to understand rheumatology and why, why we develop these Sorry. different diseases. Uh, so today I wanted to share with you some thoughts and insights what we have learned on calcinosis and why and how that may occur and maybe how we can start thinking about how to treat treat the pathogenesis or treat calcinosis in these patients. This is not relevant for this discussion, but just to disclose that I have do receive funding from certain pharma companies, but I will not mention any of that in this talk. And if ever any of you are interested afterwards to re review any of our literature, uh, there is a really good paper that we wrote on calcinosis in sclerosis last year that brings up some of the treatment aspects as well. So when it comes to calcinosis, and this goes for both dermatomyositis and for scleroderma, it's an abnormal deposition of insoluble calcium crystals in soft tissue, such as muscles or skin primarily. And these are a couple of pictures to what it may look like. And when we speak about calcinosis or calcification in these particular conditions, we call it dystrophic, meaning that it occurs despite normal levels of calcium and phosphate in the circulation or in the blood. So it's not due to dietary considerations necessarily. And since there's nothing happening systematically, we believe that there is, it's likely that calcinosis develops due to the tissue environment, so locally. So then the main question is, what happens in the tissue? What happens locally? Why do we get these calcium deposits where we get them? So this was a question that really has intrigued us for a long time. And we thought the best way to investigate that or start to getting to that question was to really look closely, closely, closely into this skin or this muscle. So what we did was to take a biopsy from a young girl with juvenile dermatomyositis who also had calcinosis. And we looked into her muscle biopsy 
and, and this is really what we found. And it can be a little bit hard to see if you're not uh, aware or used to looking at biopsies. But what these gray areas here are, they are muscle fibers. And in between all of these different fibers, you have small to large debris of calcium crystals. So they are ingra ingrained in the muscle itself, lots of small calcium deposits. And what we also find here that is an area of interest for my research is one of those big immune cells. It's a white blood cell that we call a neutrophil. We're taking one step back for those of you who may not be familiar with immunology. Most every time when you go to your doctor, they take a blood sample and, and you may get some results back. And sometimes they get a CBC or anything like that to measure your white blood cells. And our white blood cells contain lots of different immune cells. It's usually divided into two different categories. One that we call adaptive immunity. That's what we call lymphocytes. That's up, B that's down, that's mute. B cells and T cells. And then we have our innate immunity. And those are usually your first responders. They come immediately to anywhere where you get some damage or where you have an infection, and then they work rapidly whereas your lymphocytes will need a couple of days to a week to, to establish themselves. But anyway, this is within innate immunity where we find these eater cells. They love to eat. If you have a damaged tissue, if you have bacteria, anything they can find that is damaged, they come to eat it. And one of those eater cells would be the neutrophil. And that's the one that we are primarily interested in today. So neutrophils are our immune sentinels. And we're not going to go into any major details here, but you're sufficient to say that they have lots of sensors on their cell surface to allow them to sense whether there's any damage, whether there's inflammation, whether there's any bacteria or viruses. And as soon as they sense something, they can eat it and they can destroy it. And one way they destroy it is through the release of all of those small ready-to-go capsules that contains a lot of really nasty things that will cause death to the bacteria or to the virus, but also will cause damage to the tissue, some kind of collateral damage. And that is how these neutrophils work. They're very efficient in preventing infection, but they also cause damage. Uh, so just to recapitulate that, what, we have neutrophils. They are our main white blood cell in circulation. They are eater cells, they love to eat. We call that phagocytosis. Then they can also produce some oxidative damage and they can release things. And once they're done with their thing, they're usually eaten up by other eater cells just to recycle them. There is another phenomenon though that we will go into a little bit depth to, and I'll show you a video of that. When a neutrophil, instead of dying a silent death, could decide to die a more violent death and throw out a web-like structure. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in this video. <clears throat> so in this video, we have these white blood cells, neutrophils, that we find in the tissue <clears throat> eating these crystals. And what we've done in this video is that we have taken these neutrophils, that's gonna be your round black dots here, and we have given them something we call antibodies or immune complexes similar to what we find in scleroderma and in lupus. And now we'll see quickly here what happens once we feed these neutrophils with these immune complexes. And you can use this kind of sketch here as a, uh, as a marker of what is happening. And you can also see some green color here, and that's a DNA stain staining dye that will just indicate whether the cells are, are dead or alive. So the green ones are currently dead. And now we add immune complexes. And just after 10, 15 minutes, we can see that these neutrophils look different. They are activated. And now one after another, they will start looking more empty. So everything is starting to dissolve within these neutrophils. Now all of these small bombs or vesicles are being released into the neighborhood. And then one after another, they will start to pop. They will explode. And throughout, like a big cloud around them in this green uh, DNA. 
And this is a process that has been termed net formation. And this is a very important process when you want to fight infections, but it's not a good thing when you want to in healthy conditions as it causes damage. But this is what we think happens in lupus as well as in scleroderma, where we know in blood that they have these circulating immune complexes that are able to activate our immune systems. And it is causing the death and activation of these very important immune cells. So if we now zoom in on these neutrophils, this is what it looks like. And this is why they're called nets or web-like structures. So this is your DNA. This is your DNA that has been spit out from the activated immune cells. And that is being done in an attempt to capture and trap bacteria. So this is the original finding back in two, 2004, where you see this beautifully sticky DNA that has been released from these immune cells that are able to wrap themselves again around bacteria. And it's a beautiful and very important process. However, it's only important for infectious diseases. If we have this process happening outside of infection, such, such as it occurs in scleroderma or lupus or dermato, they can cause inflammation. There's lots of ongoing work also on these processes uh, facilitating or promoting atherosclerosis or thrombosis, so cardiovascular disease. There are new studies suggesting that this process is also involved in malignancy, supporting metastasis or tumor growth. And then finally, and which is important for our talk, these processes have also been linked with autoimmunity, development of autoimmune conditions in a particular rheumatic diseases. So going back now to the tissue again, where we found this, this infiltrating immune cell, he, he should not be in the tissue. There's no reason for neutrophils to be in the muscle, but something attracted it there, most likely this kind of damage to the muscle tissue. And now the question is, what is the neutrophil doing there? And is it causing any harm to the tissue? So when we zoom in even a little bit further on this immune cell, we can see that it, it is there to eat. In those small vesicles, this neutrophil has eaten some of those crystals. So the neutrophil is there to, <clears throat> to eat and ho hopefully remove some of these crystals that should not be in the muscle. So what happens now when a neutrophil decides to eat these big and small crystals? So to, we tried to address that and we made in the lab some calcium crystals. And you can see them here looking like small um, oops, my apologies, some small glass shards. So these are calcium phosphate crystals, similar to what we find in the tissue of patients with scleroderma. And here in green, again, we have cytox green. It's a DNA binding dye. And we find that as soon as a neutrophil, this immune cell finds a crystal, it becomes activated. And it undergoes a process we call frustrated eating. It really wants to help. It really wants to eat this glass shard, but it can't. It's just too big for it to eat. So it gets frustrated. And during that process of frustration, it will empty itself and release all of these long tangles of DNA to trap the glass shard or the crystal. And this happened not only for these artificial or synthetic glass shards that we made or crystals that we made, but the same was also true when we use crystals that we had taken from patients. So in this particular experiment, we took a crystal that was surgically removed from a young kid with dermatomyositis. And we added to our immune cells. And we saw that when we, when we did that, these crystals also let the neutrophils spit out these long strands of DNA. And we call this again, net formation. And more importantly, we can find these markers of nets in crystals when we isolate them from patients, but also we can find it in the blood of patients. And in particular, in patients who have calcinosis, we find that they have more, they have higher levels of these circulating 
markers of neutrophil death. And the same is also true for patients with scleroderma. And I'll show you a couple of those slides uh, later on in the presentation. But sufficient to say, just to kind of highlight what we have shown so far, in tissue, in patients with calcinosis, we find lots of small debris of calcium crystals ingrained into the tissue itself, including the muscle cells. And these crystals are being recognized by infiltrating either cells that we call neutrophils. And once these neutrophils find the crystals, they will undergo a cell death process where they will release these net-like structures. And these nets are highly inflammatory and they're also very harmful in that they can cause damage to the tissue. <clears throat> so after establishing that this is occurring in the tissue, we next asked, is this process, where does this process start? Could it be that there is any kind of damage to the muscle cell themselves? So we decided to zoom in even further into the muscle cell itself. So this is close, close up on a muscle cell or a muscle fiber. It's a damaged muscle fiber and it's highly calcified. But what we found here and which was novel and had never be, been seen before was all of the calcification that happened in within the cell. So what I have, what I have highlighted here is the mitochondria. And on the next slide, I'll go through a little bit more about what a mitochondria is. But it's simply said, it is a power plant or a nuclear plant, one of the main ways a cell can get energy. What surprised us was that most of the mitochondria within the muscle cell itself were completely crystallized. They were calcified. And this was completely unheard of. We had no idea of why this would happen in these patients with calcinosis. <clears throat> so all these black circles that you find here they used to be functional mitochondria, but now they're completely crystallized. <clears throat> so what is a mitochondria then? And we mentioned that they are power plants and nuclear plants. So they produce a lot of energy. So we need them in all of our different cells to get energy so that our cells can do whatever they need to do on a daily basis. And of course, a muscle cell requires a lot of energy to do all of the hard work. But that's not all that there is to a mitochondria. And at this point, I should also mention that mitochondria, we believe at least, is part of a remnant of a bacteria or something we call a prokaryote. Billions of years ago, I think one and a half billions, billion years ago, we believe that mitochondria or what was then a bacteria or a prokaryote decided to live within what, what were to be human cells eventually. But they made this kind of symbiosis where we had a eukaryotic cell combining with this mitochondria-like component. <clears throat> and they found that we do pretty well together. So the mitochondria decided to stay within this cell and the cell allowed it to stay. <clears throat> and since then, these two kind of components have started to work very well together. We are dependent on each other. But with that said, since this mitochondria is of a bacteria-like origin, they still to this day contain a few things that are potentially harmful to us. One thing is that these mitochondria contain cardiolipin, so it's a phospholipid, a membrane structure. And this particular membrane structure, cardiolipin, is seen as very harmful in many diseases. Some patients with scleroderma do develop these antibodies, but it's more so common in patients with lupus. But it's something that our immune system could see as potentially harmful. And even more so, these mitochondria contain other components that are bacteria-like, like certain structures, we call them n formal methionine peptides or FMET. They also contain their own DNA that is not within our nucleus, but within the mitochondria itself. And this DNA is bacteria-like. The structure is different. The, pa the patterns is different. <clears throat> My apologies. Um, so the, it is really bacteria-like, and thus it can confer or promote inflammation. So there are many things with the, bacteria, with the mitochondria that is different and that we need to be aware of. And so throughout the rest of the presentation, I'll try to 
explain to you how this calcification or crystallization of mitochondria that we see in calcinosis, how it may affect these different functions of the, of the mitochondria. <clears throat> so mitochondria, and we won't go through all of these different details, but it's really well known to regulate calcium. Sometimes your cells get stressed. And during stress, there is a lot of calcium signaling happening in a cell. And what a mitochondria does then is to take some of the calcium up and say, hey, we'll, we'll contain this calcium for now until things calm down. And calcium is positively charged. So when something positive enters the mitochondria, something negative will also have to come in to neutralize it. And so what happens in the mitochondria when you have stress in a cell is that you create hydroxyapatite crystals or calcium phosphate crystals in the mitochondria. This is a physiological process. When it becomes pathological is when you have mitochondrial stress, when you have oxidation, when you have reactive oxygen radicals um, that could affect the uptake of calcium into the mitochondria and the longevity of these crystals meaning that they will no longer be what we call amorphous, but they will precipitate. And now all of a sudden they are not soluble anymore. They are crystallizing. And this is what we find in patients with calcinosis. We find crystallized precipitates within mitochondria and outside in the tissue, of course. So we developed in an assay here. The next question we asked is, what does this do to the mitochondria? Does it matter if they're calcified or not? So we developed an assay to calcify mitochondria in muscle cells. This is just one of those pretty images where we can see the nucleus, where we have all the DNA in the cell. And then in green, we have crystals, calcium phosphate crystals. And in red, we have mitochondria. And you can see these beautifully overlapping yellow, which means that these are crystallized or calcified mitochondria. And we know in both scleroderma and dermatomyositis that inflammation is highly linked to development of calcinosis. That's one of the key things we need to do early on to address that patients do not have chronic or long-lasting inflammation, but that we treat early on to prevent development of calcinosis. We found in our model system that inflammation amplifies calcification. If we add inflammation to a skeletal muscle cell. In this case, we're adding some interferon, which is seen in scleroderma, as well as in dermatomyositis. We find that inflammation amplifies calcification as measured by this particular dye here. Another important factor when thinking about calcinosis is hypoxia. Calcinosis is highly linked to hypoxia, meaning kind of a dysregulated or impaired vasculature. So patients who have hypoxia or impaired vasculature often also develop calcinosis. And we find a set, found the same thing in our system here that when we artificially induce hypoxia in this orange pinkish bar, we see much more calcinosis in our skeletal muscle cells. So it seems like our model system do recapitulate what is happening in patients that is being driven through inflammation, it's been driven through hypoxia. <clears throat> so we then ask, what, what, what does it matter again if, if these mitochondria, these power plants become crystallized? Does it really impact the patient? Does it impact the tissue? And one way, the first question we asked was whether it affects the ability of the muscle cell to get energy to work well. And there is a beautiful technology that looks like this, and it's called a seahorse based on the, on the way it looks on the curve. And what it does is that it allows you to measure energy production or requirement in certain cells. And we're just gonna look here at something called basal respiration. That means what is the overall ability of the cell to produce energy? So here in, circles, we have a skeletal muscle cell that we haven't done anything with. And down here in the triangles, we have the calcified skeletal muscle cells. And as you can see, they have barely any capacity at all to produce energy with a value of about 25 
whereas the regular cells have about 125, so five, six-fold more energy production. So when we calcify the mitochondria, as is seen in, in calcinosis, these mitochondria are almost completely unable to produce any energy, and that will cause muscle damage and muscle weakness in these patients. So next we asked whether this calcification could also cause the damage to the mitochondria. And so what we did here was to take mitochondria, these nuclear plants, and they contain, as we mentioned, their own DNA. We can then calcify these mitochondria. And what this figure to the left is showing is that some of this mitochondrial DNA, now once this mitochondria, the nuclear plant is damaged, will start to leak out. So it will now go into the, what we call extra mitochondrial compartment or the, the cytosol, the inside of the cell. And I'm gonna warn you for this next slide that this is a fun slide for, for anyone studying immunology, but it may also be a little bit intimidating. But I wanted to mention a few things here. And that is the, to the question kind of, what do we have that can recognize all of these damages? If a mitochondria breaks, breaks apart, how can we find it? How can the cell respond to that? But before getting to that point, I wanted to mention a couple of other things. So on this slide, I'm presenting what we call pattern recognition receptors. And there are a couple of things that you probably are aware of who are suffering from this condition or who are giving care to, to family member with scleroderma or with any rheumatic disease. I'm expecting that many of you would be on a drug that we call hydroxychloroquine or are familiar with that. What one of the many effects that hydroxychloroquine has is to affect inflammation. And in particular, the recognition of DNA or nucleic acids to these particular receptors that we call toll-like receptors. So if you take hydroxychloroquine, usually DNA will not be able to be sensed by these um, molecules and will then not lead to as much inflammation. Some of you may have heard of or maybe even experienced a drug called anakinra. It's an IL-1 beta blocker. What it does is to affect this process here that we call inflammasome activation. So what these two kind of pathways here do is that they recognize the damage or even viral infections or bacterial infections and they cause a signal usually leading to inflammation. In the case of mitochondria go, breaking apart within the cell, there are a couple of different other receptors in, the, in this compartment. And the one that we are gonna look at a little bit at least is called C-gas. So C-gas is a receptor that we all have in the cytosol, inside of the cell. And it's really there to find DNA from bacteria or from viruses, or even from mitochondria that break apart. So what happens is that mitochondrial DNA can bind or recog be recognized by this receptor, and then that will lead to inflammation, and in particular to interferon production. And we found that if we now calcify skeletal muscle cells, they will start producing interferon. This is just a marker of interferon production of inflammation. And if we then block this pathway, this DNA receptor pathway, we can restore that. So what our findings here suggest is that when you have calcinosis, there will be damage to your mitochondria in the tissue. And that damage will lead to inflammation. And it may be inflammation through this particular pathway. And I would like to mention that many companies are interested in this pathway for rheumatic autoimmune conditions and are developing new drugs to target this. So I'm hopeful that within a couple of years, we'll see drugs targeting this inflammatory pathway and that that, and that, that may help to reduce inflammation in tissue in particular in patients with um, dermatomyositis, lupus, and scleroderma. So to summarize the second part of the, of the talk, we have now discussed a little bit about what happens inside the tissue, in a particular in the skeletal muscle cells, where you have this activation of the nuclear plant in mitochondria, and that will lead to calcification or crystallization of the mitochondria. And this will blunt 
the capacity of these mitochondria to work functionally, and it will also cause inflammation. And inflammation is a very important trigger of calcinosis. And then during the final part of the talk, I wanted to also bring up a couple of thoughts about extracellular mitochondria or markers of this process and how and if we can monitor calcinosis more in a better way. And this is again a picture from a woman with dermatomyositis. And we found that when these muscle cells are so damaged by the calcification that, they, that the muscle cells are actually dying, they do release these calcium crystals, the mitochondria, the calcified mitochondria into the tissue itself. And this is where we see all of these aggregates of calcium crystals that can now start building up like big mountains, if you would, and pierce, pierce your skin or anything like that. So this is coming from within the muscle cell and then being released into the tissue. And we can even find evidence of this in the blood, in the circulation. Many times when you go to the clinic and if you take a research sample, we ask to, and we bring that to the lab and we spin it down, we remove all the cells and then we just save the small yellow part, which we call serum or plasma. And we can use those research samples and study markers of mitochondria or markers of inflammation or anything like that. And here we have looked for a marker of mitochondria, namely the mitochondrial DNA levels. And we looked at it in healthy controls in patients, if this is dermatomyositis, without calcinosis and those with calcinosis. And we found primarily mitochondrial DNA in those patients who have calcinosis. Like it's consistent with, with this release of mitochondria from the muscle in those patients. And we also find other markers of mitochondria in the blood of these patients with dermatomyositis. So it's clear, at least from, from dermatomyositis, that mitochondria are being released from the tissue into the blood. And we can use these markers to monitor muscle damage and activity in these patients. So is this only unique for dermatomyositis or can we find mitochondria also in scleroderma? So this is a paper we published last year where we have two different scleroderma cohorts. One was from the US, a little bit older cohort, and one was um, from, from Sweden and it's a smaller cohort. Um, and these were collected, I think, early 2000, and these were more closer to 2010 or so. But nevertheless, we have fairly big cohorts of scleroderma patients here to start asking some important questions. So we asked the question of whether we can find in the blood of patients with scleroderma, if we can find evidence, evidence of mitochondria of these nuclear plants outside of cells. And here we have looked at something we call FMET, N formal methionine and peptides. These are components of the mitochondria. And we find them highly elevated in patients with scleroderma in both of those two cohorts that we studied. And this is primarily seen in patients with diffuse um, disease. So this is again a very novel finding. There is something causing mitochondria to be released in scleroderma. So these particular mitochondria I mentioned before are inflammatory. They do, do look like bacteria. And that goes also for this component that we call FMET or n formal methionine peptide. They are really good at activating these immune cells that we spoke about in the beginning, the neutrophils. And once they do so, the neutrophils will become activated, release oxidative stress and upregulate some markers to make them more sticky so they can go into the tissue. Given now that we found these markers in, in blood from scleroderma patients, we asked, can blood from scleroderma patients activate neutrophils? And is this driven through this pathway? And this is just a drug that we can add to block this particular process. So we started to look at that. And so what we did here is again to take a neutrophil, 
And if we add blood from a healthy individual, as we see here, there's not much activation at all. But if we add blood from a patient with scleroderma, we see that this blood will activate the neutrophil. And when we block this particular receptor that binds to mitochondria, we can restore that activation. So in brief, what we were able to demonstrate here is that scleroderma patients have mitochondria in the blood, and these mitochondrial components can, can and will activate neutrophils to contribute to inflammation. And what we demonstrated here is that this may be another pathway moving forward where we can reduce this systemic inflammation in patients with scleroderma. We also found, as I showed in the last picture, we believe that this process can activate neutrophils. And that's exactly what we found, and that patients with scleroderma do have more activated neutrophils. And we can measure that with this marker called calprotectin. And that's elevated in patients with scleroderma as compared to healthy controls. And more importantly, it seems to distinguish patients with more severe disease, including those with scarring or fibrotic disease, as well as those with more involvement of heart or heart failure as measured by this pro-BNP. So the more organ damage or more damage or challenge you have with your heart, the more inflammation mediated by the neutrophil you will have. So it seems to be an important process that neutrophil activation causes inflammation and organ damage. And this is driven by these circulating mitochondria, these circulating nuclear plants that should not be in the, in the blood. Another important aspect before we end this, this part of the session, these mitochondria, as I mentioned, are or do look like a bacteria. So our immune system should see them as a bacteria and try to produce antibodies towards them. So my lab developed, and this is something we often do and are pretty good at, developed a new assay to see if we can find antibodies towards mitochondria in dermatomyositis as well as in scleroderma. So we isolated mitochondria and we then incubated them with blood from patients and if they then have antibodies, they will bind to the mitochondria and we can then detect them with different colors. And to do so, we use a machine called flow cytometry. So looking at this in juvenile dermatomyositis, and here we have AMA, anti-mitochondrial antibodies. We find, find that patients with calcinosis in dermatomyositis, most of them, though not all of them, are positive for this new antibody against mitochondria. However, it is important to also note that we have some false positive, if you would, some patients that do not have calcinosis, at least yet, are also positive for this antibody. So we asked, could it be that these patients that are positive will eventually develop calcinosis? Maybe they have a subclinical um, uh, disease. So we looked at this and we found that even before the patients developed a clinical diagnosis of calcinosis, we could find these antibodies. This is a fairly small cohort, but we are, so far, these data are suggesting at least that this novel antibody may be a very good predictive marker of what is going to happen in the future, meaning that we may be able to tell that these patients are prone to develop calcinosis and we may thus be able to better so monitor them and maybe give them even more so aggressive treatment. This is all done in dermatomyositis and that's where we have had so far the best research uh, cohorts to study. But we have done some work also in scleroderma and that is certainly something we are interested in following up more on. Here we have studied one particular antibody targeting mitochondria called anticox 4 i one this is a particular mitochondrial structure. And we find that these levels or these novel antibodies are primarily seen in patients with diffuse scleroderma. And they correlate very well with active skin involvement. So the more antibodies you have, the more active you are in your skin. So far, we have not been able to investigate the association between these antibodies and calcinosis in scleroderma.
but that is something that we're currently investigating. We're working with groups at both Stanford and at John Hopkins to find to get access to good clinically correct, well characterized patient cohorts. But so far, the novelty is still there that patients with scleroderma have antibodies that have not been described before that do target mitochondria. And they seem to have a clinical relevance in identifying a subset of patients uh, that have more so severe skin involvement. So to summarize um, our current understanding, and I should admit that this is, we have a limited understanding of the pathogenesis of calcinosis, but what our data at least would suggest at this point is that there could be a trigger in the muscle or the skin for that say, sake, where you have trauma, where you have hypoxia, inflammation or infection, or even based on your genetic predisposition that causes mitochondrial, these nuclear plants, activation and damage. And once you have that damage, the mitochondria will start accumulating these crystals within the mitochondria. This causes damage to the mitochondria. It loses its capacity to generate energy and you, receive, you get muscle weakness. We also see that these crystals containing mitochondria are now released out into the tissue where they accumulate and start building up these big aggregates of calcium phosphate crystals. This causes inflammation, including interferon production, as well as infiltration of immune cells, including these eater cells that we call neutrophils. The presence of these mitochondria outside of cells also lead to the development of antibodies towards mitochondria, and something we find in both scleroderma and in dermatomyositis. And finally, due to this inflammation, we have a reduced capacity to produce a particular enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, so we can't degrade these um, crystals. There's another finding also in scleroderma of reduced levels of inorganic pyrophosphate that is also contributing to these crystal formation that I didn't have time to go into. And I'm currently working with a group at Stanford and at NIH in studying the genetic background for this, 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 these lower levels of PPIs and hopefully something we can present on shortly. But it's sufficient to say that there are mechanisms also outside of what I mentioned today that allow for these crystals to remain much longer than what they should in tissue. And this then leads to this again, frustrated eating, frustrated phagocytosis of crystals by the immune cells, furthering inflammation and then causing even more damage to the tissue. So this is currently our understanding of what is happening in the muscle cell when causing calcinosis. We're currently working with both dermatomyositis and with scleroderma, trying to see if we can use any of these markers as helpful markers to monitor and predict calcinosis and overall disease development in these patients. We're also working with pharma to develop new drugs targeting either the inflammatory processes or the process of calcinosis itself to hopefully alleviate that and get rid of this bad side effect of this disease shortly. Uh, we are just briefly moving forward with, again, looking into tissue of patients with scleroderma to see if we can find similar evidence of calcified mitochondria there by using these markers to study prognosis and diagnosis as well as intervene with these processes. And finally, I wanted to just mention briefly that we also are studying genetics, including in mitochondria, which has not been done before in these conditions. And this is in collaboration with NIH and Stanford, where we look at a couple of gene variations or mutations, if you would, in the mitochondria itself. And we have found, for the time being, three variants that we're really interested in. One that is common in healthy controls, about 25, one in four patient or individuals should have it. In dermatomyositis and scleroderma patients, and these are selected to have calcinosis, only one in 10 have this particular variant. And then there's one that we only see one in 10 in healthy controls, but one in three patients with scleroderma and calcinosis have this particular variant. And then there's a third variant with a similar phenotype. So there are seem to be genetic or gene variants that could predispose to calcinosis. 
and we're currently making a really fancy or fun, I think, method to study this further in which we take a muscle cell and we poison the muscle cell to kill the nuclear plants. We want to get rid of the nuclear plants. And then we can take platelets or some cells from patients in which we know that they have calcinosis. And we can take their mitochondria and put them into this empty muscle cell. And we can now create muscle cells that have everything in common other than that their mitochondria, the nuclear plants, are from either different diseases or maybe having different gene variants. And we can now start asking questions about what does the mitochondria do and how does these gene variants affect the mitochondrial function and capacity to promote inflammation and calcinosis. And this will really help us understand better so how does the mitochondria contribute to disease. Finally, I would just mention or put up the slide at least to highlight all of my colleagues in my lab and as well as collaborators who have participated in these studies. And I'm very grateful for any thoughts you may have on this project and any insights you have on the disease and thoughts on how we can best move forward in this field together. Any, sorry, Vicky? Christian, thank you. It's such a high level, interesting talk. Thank you, Mark. I had, I had one question. Um, well, the presentation was amazing. I am, I've had calcinosis for 20 years and struggle with it so much, but I'm wondering if, um, I know it's recorded, will we be able to um, access this talk from Dr. Lude? If you can't, then just shoot me an email. I'm sure Christina or Mark or anyone can give you my email information, or you can find it on our website. I would be happy to send it to you. I will have okay. to take away the video because it's too large to send, but okay. otherwise I'll be happy to send any information. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Any. Okay, I will do that. Thank you so much. Of course. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so I have some calcinosis, but I have had lower leg extremity um, ulcers for going on over four years now. Um, and they're starting to grow bigger again. They're really large. Is this kind of the same process happening in that? Or do you have any idea? This is probably going to be a better question for Mark, I think. But, but in general, what we have seen is that not always does calcinosis and overall disease activity go together. Many people could be in remission, if you would, from your disease. And then all of a sudden they can get a calcinosis flare. It seems to be almost two different diseases, but they do go together. And usually when you see kind of vascular damage or ulcers or anything like that, that could be in my mind, at least a uh, connected with calcinosis. But I think Mark, Dr. Wenner would be a better person to answer that. Okay. Uh, just uh, in my experience, sometimes the areas of calcinosis can break down and lead to ulcers, which I think is what you're asking about. Um, but ulcers can come from other uh, causes as well. They're, they aren't always associated with, with calcinosis. But um, as, as many of you, I think, know the calcium can be right near the surface of the skin and even minor uh, uh, you know, trauma, abrasion, rubbing can lead them to be exposed. And then sometimes they just seem to pop out. And sometimes they actually cause irritation uh, and the, there's inflammation around the calcium. Uh, those neutrophils, the white blood cells that Dr. Lude showed <clears throat> inside the calcium can also cause inflammation in the tissue around it. And that also can lead to uh, an ulcer. So uh, several different mechanisms Calcinosis is one of the mechanisms that can lead to skin ulcers, including uh, those in the in the legs. Do you guys have any um, uh, new or different help for that? I'm kind of running out of options after four years, um, and I do go to Seattle, so is it worth going up to visit? <laughs> I, I'm running out of plate. I'm giving up on these dang ulcers because they won't go away. Um, I, I'll, I'll make one comment about that is, is we have many, many treatments 
for calcinosis, which is kind of a problem, right? If if one worked, we wouldn't need more than one. And so uh, the issue is that nothing works all the time for everybody. And I'll, I'll put that question back to Dr. Lude. What, what do you see on the horizon as a general treatment for calcinosis, realizing, again, if we had one, uh, we'd all know about it, but is there something on the horizon? Do your studies give us some promise for all different approaches to treating calcinosis? Right, so this was a big topic and we just got home from a big conference down in San Diego, ACR, which is a yearly rheumatology conference. And I was participating in a session there on calcinosis and dermatomyositis. And the room was just crowded, in particular with clinicians who wanted to know and understand how can we best treat calcinosis. And so the word out there is, as Dr. Wenner said, that it's very hard to know what treatment will work for certain patients and not. There are lots of different options. One that seems promising, at least for dermatomyositis, and I would assume based on the pathogenesis that it could work for scleroderma too, would be JAK-STAT inhibitors. It seemed to be fairly promising in reducing or even removing calcinosis in some patients, but it's not for everyone. But, but the principle of them being that they regulate inflammation or reduce kind of interferon signaling and, and the well-known role of that in this pathogenesis. So I think that could be one fairly new uh, drug to try, but there are also clinical studies ongoing with, within this process of, um, it was briefly mentioned at the end, this inorganic pyrophosphate um, uh, levels being reduced in, scler uh, in scleroderma. There are some trials ongoing on that too, to regulate that, to try to help our own body to dissolve the crystals. Um, but, but it's still in clinical trial, but, but do know that this is something that is very, very important for the field and that there are things in progress to try to find new, new mechanisms or new drugs to treat it. But as of now, we don't have any golden drug that can do, do it for everyone. I have a question. Um, I have limited scleroderma with the cetramere, and I've only had calcinosis, calcinosis in the fingers, and I've had surgeries where they've taken out the crystals. So in your research, have you done any differentiation between diffuse and limited scleroderma and calcinosis? We have not, but I would love to do that. And I think we will do that once we get a bigger cohort, because once we start to divide patients into limited and diffuse and then with and without calcinosis they get so small groups all of a sudden so we have not been able to do that what we have seen is that there are differences in your immune system or inflammation whether you have limited or diffuse and we have seen some of that related to neutrophils and to mitochondria but we have not been able to look into calcinosis specifically yet but i think that's a fascinating thing and it's certainly something we should should do try to understand that better Related. So is, there, is there a reason why we would only get them in the fingers and not through the whole body? I, well, I would, would suggest that some of that may relate to hypoxia or terrain noise if you would low kind of blood circulation in those extremities and those areas. And plus that those are areas where you have more kind of trauma. You hit them more often, you touch things kind of. And all of that, both trauma and hypoxia or this kind of vascular damage, they both contribute to this process of calcinosis. So I think that's one reason that we see that. That's also why we sometimes see it more in the, in the buttocks or knees or kind of areas where we sit often, where we have tension. Um, so those would be the areas where we usually see calcification, but not least in the fingertips. And I think that's mainly due to the low vascular kind of um, the damage. Related to that question, um, have you had the chance to study uh, a, a number of different calcium deposits and see how much variability there is within the calcium deposit itself in the area of calcinosis? We have not, but I, I was I met with a couple of people from NIH who also mentioned the same thing and wanted us to study a couple of other crystal diseases and something we're happy to do. I just, uh, I, at the American College of Rheumatology meeting that we, uh, that Dr. Luda and I both just came back from, uh, 
uh, I uh, ran into somebody in Australia who has a calcinosis center. And we had had that conversation. Now that more patients are getting calcinosis treated by surgical removal of the calcium nodule, could we have a repository of calcium nodules? Yeah. Uh, maybe it should be at the University of Washington because mm -hmm. that's easier to get to than Australia. Um, uh, but uh, calcium deposits wouldn't be hard to transport from you know one area to another so that there's a central repository of mm -hmm. calcium deposits from different diseases, different sites, because I think uh, we don't have that much information, frankly. It is something we are setting up. I'm actually leading that effort within rheumatic diseases here in the U.S., primarily through the muscular diseases. It's a consortium called IMAX. We're setting up that now to kind of make it more cohesive the way we collect samples. And one of those will certainly be calcium crystals that are surg surgically removed because we would like to see that collected so we can collaborate and work together to understand it better. So if uh, some of the people on this uh, Zoom call are planning to get calcium deposits removed, should they get in contact with you to think about how to do that? Is it at the stage where the specimens can be collected or stored? And, and we would certainly to love, do that? love to. We would certainly love to store them. And we have permission to collect samples, um, so that would be fantastic. But but only if it doesn't add any extra, you know, effort or concern for for the patients. That was kind of going to be my question. How can we, as a group of scleroderma patients in the Pacific Northwest, help you to get a larger cohort of scleroderma patients so that you can do the research on scleroderma patients? Uh, currently, we don't have any initiative to, to collect samples, but I think anytime in general, when you are being approached by your, your physician or your rheumatologist and they tell you, hey, we have this fascinating, interesting research going on, would you be willing to give a blood sample. I think those are wonderful opportunities for you to participate in helping us, um, you know, promote and moving forward in this field. Now, I have a question. Um, I, I oh, maybe four or five years ago, I've had a large calcium deposit on my left shin from an old skiing injury. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a large chunk of it removed. And all that did was it took three years to heal. And now I have many, many buddies. And yeah. so now I have four openings um, that are just so hard to manage. And it's really difficult to find anybody, even regular wound care. They don't know what to do with these. So, so um, that there was another comment at, at this conference who we went to, they, their, their suggestion was that if you don't necessarily need to do it, do not do surgical removal unless it's really kind of causing you harm because the 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 um, the risk of infection and the wound healing could be really hard. Yeah, I wish I would have known that. <laughs> yeah. But that's the other problem. Doctors don't know either. No, they don't. This is a, exactly. Yeah. I, I wouldn't blame the doctor because it's a emergency no, I don't. field. And, uh, I don't. But, but it's hard. I, I hear you on that. It's, it's a hard thing. And we should only take them away if they are kind of sterically or hindering you from kind of doing your regular day-to-day -day activities. Well, it was infected and would not, they were having a hard time getting it to heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's just nothing out there right now. For the wound healing? or for, I mean, there are lots of, lots of ones, but it may be that you have to try a couple of different ones. I think the main one would still be to keep your disease in control. That's kind of the priority to keep inflammation down. And then once you have that, you can try a diff couple of different versions. And I'm sure Dr. Wenner will speak a little bit about those different drugs that could, could help. Um, but there's not one drug that could help everyone, but you may have to try around a few of them. And different wound specialists are more or less accustomed to treating uh, these kinds of problems, but it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. And there isn't yeah. anything that is uniformly known to work and, and everybody. Uh, sometimes it's trial and error. Mm -hmm. We hope to get better. And again, I think I'm excited by your research, uh, uh, Christian. And uh, I think just knowing that it's that people like you are doing research and paying attention to it, uh, I think is, is inspiring and gives us all hope uh, for how to, how to manage uh, our own diseases if we have them or how to treat patients if we're 
trying to um, improve the outcome. Um, if no more questions, maybe we should head over to you, Dr. Weiner. I'm, oh, uh, one more. I have oh. one more question. Um, is, is there, I mean, if you see, you know, in the near horizon, if there's a study with a low dose naltrexone for autoimmune or, you know, specifically for scleroderma or lupus? I'm not aware of it, but I don't know if about you, Dr. Weiner. I am not aware of a study targeted on that. Uh, uh, do you know of one? Um, is that Evelyn? Is that can I call you that? Do yes. you know of one? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Um, uh, the the low dose naltrexone. Um, no, it's being used in a variety of <laughs> conditions. I am not aware of any formal studies uh, about its use, though. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, yes, I we can uh, move on to talk uh, about another topic. Uh...